Thank you. No way I'm going to compete with the introduction. I want to start by thanking AJC for hosting me here in Washington. A special thank. Uh, thank you to AGC President Stanley Bergman, to AGC Executive Director David Harris, to AGC's Jerusalem Director Avital Leibovic, and even though he's not here, to AGC's Jerusalem Chair Matthew Bronfman. I want to talk about a moment. It is my defining moment, even though it happened before I was born. It didn't happen to me, yet I wouldn't be standing here if it didn't happen. In February 1945, my father, the late Joseph Tommy Lapid, was, was a 13-year-old kid living in the basement on the Budapest ghetto with his grandmother, mostly living with my grandmother, his mother, mostly living off meat of horses who had died in the street. And the Russians were close to Budapest, and the Germans and the Hungarian fascists started leading the Jews in death marches. They led most of them to the Danube River, which was frozen, and they forced the Jews to break the ice, holes in the ice, and then they shot them into the water. And the Danube was red this year. Early one Monday morning, the Germans surrounded my father's block and took about 600 people on such a death march. They walked through the streets of Budapest, which were empty because of the rushing bombing raids. From the windows, people who knew that the Jews were being marched to the death looked on them. And at some point, when they reached the Margit Bridge, a Russian plane lowered over this convoy, and people started to run and scream. And the Germans raised the Schmeisser machine guns and shot into the sky. And my father hid behind a small public bathroom, painted in green. And his mother stood behind him, and she pushed him into this bathroom and told him that he has to pee. And it's hard. It's hard to pee when you're 13 and they're shooting and... <laughs> but he was a good kid. <laughs> so he pretended to pee. And the death march carried on. And 15 minutes later, everyone in this convoy was dead. From the 600 people, 598 people were dead, but my father, everyone but my father and my grandmother. And they stood in the street, free, without the yellow star, which my father has ripped off his clothes. And they could have gone anywhere. Here in the American Midwest, there were thousands of miles in which no one, else, no one lived. In the Australian bush, I once flew from Sydney to Perth. They lived less people than in the Budapest ghetto. London was free. Paris was about to be liberated. Mussolini has already been hanged in Italy. But my father, a 13-year-old boy, had nowhere to go to. Many years later, I traveled to Budapest with my father. We, we were walking in the street together, and he was in a good mood. It was the looks and foods and colors of his childhood. But suddenly he stopped and he looked at something and he started to cry. He pointed at something and he says, yeah, 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 look, look, yeah, yeah, look. And I looked and there was nothing there. It was an empty street. The only thing I could see in this empty street was a small public bathroom painted it green. Over, now it's covered also with graffiti, but it's still there. I, I went last year to Budapest, and I went to visit this public bathroom. I'm the only person on earth who's doing pilgrimage. <laughs> to publish bathroom. And when my father relaxed, he said to me, this is it. This is 
the place I was saved. And this is the place you were actually born. And this is a place with that in which, without understanding, my Zionism was born. Because here was where I understand that I have to have always a place to go to. My friends, we are all part of something. We are committed to one another. We share a collective memory. We share the fact that being Jewish is not only a religion. It is a whole civilization. It is a civilization which gave the world the Ten Commandments, 172 words, which changed the world more than all the tanks and fighter jets combined. A civilization which gave the world the wonderful idea that faith is a commitment to be a better person. A civilization which gave birth to the Talmud and to Freud, to the Rambam and Einstein, to Kafka and Bashevis Singer, to Woody Allen and Bob Dylan. <laughs> a civilization which connects us all in this thing called the Jewish nation. I'm happy that we connected to the past and that our past is always with us. I'm happy that I'm a link in the chain which guarantees the future. More than anything, I'm happy to belong. Of all the things in the world, the saddest existence is the disconnected one. One without roots, one without a clear identity. The state of Israel is the beating heart of the Jewish people. And it is your insurance and mine that we will always belong. There is no greater joy in the world than that. People always want to be part of something. And we have been given a gift. Our basic human desire to belong is met every day by our commitment and our good fortune to be part of the Jewish people. For the state of Israel, you are all an asset. Your sense of Jewish community and the solidarity of the Jewish world with the state of Israel is more than admirable. It is an existential necessity. And because you are of such crucial importance to us, we need to find a new way to work, a far better way to work on the connection with you. We have built a relationship that goes both ways in which you feel we listen. And even more importantly, you feel that your Jewish choices are respected. Because there are all sorts of Jews. There are those who insist on every detail of Jewish law, minor or major, and that's their right, and I respect that. But Judaism is not a competitive sport with the players in the end, in which whoever carried out the greatest number of mitzvot wins the trophy. Judaism is a combination of tradition and morality, of the past and of innovation of the commitment to God and our commitment to one another. Most Israelis, like most Jews across the world, want their Judaism to be pluralist, sane, and welcoming. Judaism shouldn't, be, shouldn't imprison ideas, but be spark for the creation of new ideas. Judaism shouldn't be something that divides us but something that connects us. Judaism shouldn't serve political interests because it's answer to one basic law, be a good person. A year ago, I spoke at the funeral of Gilad Shire. Many of you might remember him. He was, may his memory be blessing, he was one of the three boys kidnapped from the bus stop in the West Bank and murdered by Hamas. At the funeral, I repeated, repeated the words of Haria Kadosh, one of the great rabbis of Tzefat in the 1500s. I take upon myself 
the commandment to love the others as myself. For that commandment to be fully filled, we still have a long way to go. Today, 67 years after the founding of Israel, we face the challenge of building a public space which includes all streams of Judaism. A space which respects the different communities, a space which articulates the understanding that a shared country demands compromise and respect towards one another. Since entering political life, one thing that surprises me time and time again is how afraid people are of change. If you ask them, they say, yes, of course, we want change, they support change. But when it comes closer, and things really start to change, they respond with fear and with anger. Yeshati, the party which I lead, is doing and will continue to do everything in its power to ensure equality between all Jewish movements in Israel and abroad. Orthodox, <laughs> conservative, reform, and others. In all aspects conversion, budgets, and of course, before the law. No one can claim ownership over the God of Judaism. All politics cannot determine something eternal like Jewish identity because it's just wrong. We're in politics to create a social revolution, and one crucial aspect of it is civil unions and every, because every person, Jewish or not Jewish, gay or straight, who wants to live with someone else and build a life together has to be able to do so. <laughs> Why are we even talking about this? The right to love. It's a basic human right. We don't have an argument with the Orthodox establishment regarding marriage and divorce. But we have to provide a civil alternative as well. It is a matter of religious freedom. <laughs> we are also doing everything we can to ensure that women can pray in the kotel, wrapped in talit if they choose. because that is also a matter of religious freedom. We are working to provide non-religious civil burial in Israel because our identity as Jews, as citizens, as people accompanies us from cradle to the grave. It is person's right to choose how they will die and how they will be buried. Jewish pluralism cannot be limited just to the United States or Europe. The state of Israel cannot continue to be the only country in the Western world where Jews do not have freedom of religion. <laughs> That's our duty, not just as a political movement, not just as elected, rep elected representatives, not just as citizens of Israel. It's our duty as Jews and as human beings. These aren't the only challenges we face. There are others. Israel is not a normal Western country. We live in the most complicated neighborhood in the world, and we are the neighbors no one likes. <laughs> Israeli flags are burnt in the Tahrir Square in Cairo, in Revolution Square in Tehran, in Malti Square in Damascus, and in El Jundi Square in, in Gaza. The Palestinians and the radical Islamic forces backed by Iran are attacking us on diplomatic stage and on the military front. All this, all this happening while Iran continues its nuclear program. Global jihadi organizations are on our borders. ISIS and Al-Qaeda in the north, ISIS and Al Nusra in the north, and Al Qaeda and, and, and Salafi jihadists in the in the south, and 
in the middle of all this, we have this painful breakdown of relationship with the United States administration. If not properly addressed, it won't just disappear. It needs to be dealt with in a very different manner. I was at the Jerusalem Post conference in New York yesterday. I was there when the crowd booed Treasury Secretary, Secretary Jack Lowe, Lou. It was disgraceful. I, I know Jack, I've worked with Jack. He is a great member of the American Jewish community and a great friend for Israel. We do not need to fight among ourselves. We need each other more than ever. There is something we should remember, something we Israelis don't say enough to the United States. We are grateful. The friendship between our two countries is not taken for granted. It is a choice built upon shared values and we mu that we must cherish. The fact that the world's leading power chose Israel as its ally and close friend is a source of pride for every Israeli. And we have to repeat this again and again. Our friendship, our alliance is the cornerstone of Israel's foreign policy. It is our duty to do everything to respect and preserve that friendship. My friends, across the world, there is a campaign against Israel's very existence. Anti-Semitic groups, predominantly from the left, are leading a campaign which isn't against Israeli products. It isn't against the settlements. It is against the very idea that the Jewish people should have a state of their own. The BDS movement is hypocritical and counterproductive and infested with anti-Semitism. The Boycott Israel movement, which is operated from afar by radical Islamic groups and is find, founded by oil money, is not interested in bringing Israel back to the negotiating table. They have one aim, that Israel will cease to exist. They don't want a Palestinian sta state alongside Israel. They want a Palestinian state instead of Israel. At FIFA, a disaster was averted at the last moment. In Europe, we have already lost much of the progressive center. And, and the CEO of Orange, one of the world's largest cellular companies, has publicly said he wants to cut business ties with us. It's time for us to move from defense to offense. Instead of trying to prove that the, thank you. Instead of trying to prove to them that yes, we are a democracy, we need to expose the BDS movements for what they really are, puppets of the darkest regimes and terror organizations in the entire world. Yesh Atid will lead the fight against the BDS movement. On this, there is no coalition and opposition. We stand united against the threat, and we need our American friends with us. We need the Jewish community. We need you. We really need you. I know you are there for us, and I'm grateful for the important work being done by AJC, and on this thought, the, 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 on, on, on all diplomatic uh, uh, outreach, the, the diplomatic outreach. We also need to change course on other issues together. Mainly, we need to change course on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Not because of BDS, but because it is right for Israel. We must return to the negotiation table so that we can separate from the Palestinians. There are, those, <clears throat> there are those we can talk to. There is a coalition of a more moderate states in the Arab world today, Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf states. Those country, countries want to cooperate with us in the fight against radical Islam. We can convene 
a regional summit which will lead to our separation from the Palestinians while maintaining the settlement blocks, prevent the threat of the right of return, and ensuring strict security guarantees. But above everything, Israel cannot, and Israel must not, try to absorb 3.5 million Palestinians because this will be the end of Israel as a democratic Jewish state. Yes, it would be a dramatic step, and it could change the direction of the country. It requires strong leadership, that decisiveness, and the ability to implement ideas. It requires courage and clear vision and professionalism. It will remove the shackle from around our neck. It will allow us to fully feel our, full, our potential. I know the crisis in the relationships, relations with the United States is, is difficult for us and also for you, for this room. It isn't easy for anyone. And we should work towards a regional summit with the entire international community and side by side with this administration in a truly bipartisan manner. Our challenges are many and they are great. But only a Jewish state, a democratic one, based on tradition, and yet which sanctifies pluralism of ideas and the connections to you, the Jewish world, can meet them, all those challenges. We will continue to fight for the character of the state of Israel, an island. Israel is an island, an island of sanity in a troubled region, so that you will always, always, See us as your home and your source of pride. Thank you for all the great job things you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much.